game one and let us begin. So d4, one sec. Okay, so d4, um, let's go with a, a king's Indian. 1500, ha <laughs> Well, I like that look. Yeah, 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 I, I, need, I need to shave, I agree. You're hilarious, Aquila. You're, you're like so funny right now. I'm honestly, I'm laughing really, really hard, man. Okay, so <clears throat> we're gonna play the king's Indian and let's see how Kira's chimpanzee handles it. So we castle. This is all very standard. Thank you, Freezy Sub, for the prime. Okay, so uh, Curious plays the London system approach to the King's Indian, which is very much a legitimate line. We're now going to play d6. And as I've explained several times, in the King's Indian, black has two main pawn breaks. The most traditional pawn break is e5, and the whole idea of putting the bishop on f4 is that you make it a lot more difficult for black to play e5. That should be obvious to people. But when you play bishop f4, you allow black to execute another pawn break, uh, and that other pawn break becomes quite a bit stronger when the bishop is outside of the pawn chain. What other pawn break am I talking about? How else can we control part of the center? And we're gonna do that here because we haven't done much of that. Yeah, the move is c5. So. You lose some of the, how should I put it, the King's Indian-ness of this line. Thank you, VP. Indeed, indeed. The King's Indian is gonna be curious about some of the, is, is gonna be curious about who's pounding, the King's Indian, the chimpanzee is gonna be curious about who's pounding him. <laughs> so the King's Indian is gonna be curious. Think of Banadad. Okay, what I was gonna say is, exclam claim, what does that mean? I don't understand what's what's happening. Yeah, anyways. So, it's more in the spirit of the King's Indian to play e5, but c5 is also fine. Now, do we take on d4? Is there any need for us to take on d4? And if not, what would be a good move here? Okay, we, we're focused on the game here. Yeah, there's no need, just knight c6. We, we just develop our knight. There's absolutely no need for us to, whoops, penguin is playing for sure. Ooh, interesting, okay. There's absolutely no need for us to, oh, you had to type claim. That's a new 19101 with five subs, exactly. So knight c6, and now we can develop our bishop to g4. Very important that, and thank you, yeah, boy, DM, thank you, Neo. There's absolutely no need to take on d4. That would actually give up part of the center. So we're going to play bishop g4. All right, I don't think claim claim works like that. Yeah, so now <clears throat> white goes h3 and we have to, yeah, I'm kind of distracted by this claim thing. Hard for me to, to focus on explaining. So basically we have to decide whether we take on f3 or not. Now bishop h5 is out, out of the question because that, that loses the bishop to g4, but um, Bishop takes f3 might seem like a bad idea to people. Why are we moving the bishop twice? What do we accomplish with this trade? What is it exactly that we accomplish with this trade? Because it seems that we actually just make white's bishop stronger. But this trade accomplishes... Um, this trade actually accomplishes something very specific. Yes, we, we remove the protection on d4. Holy smokes! 5G ramen bowl with 10 subs. Oh my god. Damn, girl. Damn, okay, so the d4 pawn has been weakened. Thank you so much for the 10 gifted subs. I'll thank everyone properly after the game. How do we pressure that pawn? We now need to pressure the d4 pawn with a move that brings another piece out of the game. There is a very simple way to do that. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about d5 after the game. And in fact, maybe Curious will play d5. Yeah, the move is queen b6. <laughs> so e5 would be a very weakening move. We would weaken the d5 square. So queen b6, we are now threatening to take the pawn. Now, what's the big deal here? Why is it that we are doing all of this? We actually want him to play d5. We actually want him to play d5. And if he plays d5, I will explain why. Yes, he does. 
What is the effect of the move d5? The effect of this move is that this bishop is now open. And that is a very serious bishop. It is uncontested on the long diagonal. The other thing that happens as a consequence of d5 is that the c4 pawn, well, a pawn chain is created. And you guys already know that when a pawn chain is created, you got to think about attacking the base of the pawn chain. Can we attack the base of the pawn chain? So knight e5 would allow him to take on e5. And we would have to slightly ruin our pawn structure, but we can do the same thing from a5. And the, the good thing about this move, why I like this move from an illustrative standpoint, is that it puts the knight on a, on a rim. The knight is on a corner. And people might be looking at this and saying, well, isn't this knight bad? Knights on the rim are grim. But when you reach the level of like 1600 plus, you, you need to be able to violate some of these opening prints, some of these general principles. Otherwise, you'll be completely constrained. Um, you won't be able to make any move because it violates some sort of obscure principle. Now, this bishop is really opened up. So let's move the knight back to open up the diagonal for the bishop and pressure the knight. Curious is playing really, really well, I have to say. But now we have an interesting plan. Yeah, now we go queen b4 to attack the knight again. So the bishop is now cooperating with the queen. Let's see what um what white does here. And the knight doesn't have that many good squares. There's another idea that queen b4 has. There's another idea that queen b4 has. Queen d2 is very good. And the other idea that it has, again, thinking about attacking the c4 pawn. It's, yeah, so we want to go b5. But if we go b5 right now, he's going to take the pawn. So we can prepare b5 with the move a6. We can prepare b5 with the move a6, very simple. And once we play b5, we start getting a lot of play on that queen side. And as Boer 30, thank you for the prime. This is more of a Benoni. That's why I like to play e5 rather than, rather than c5, because this is more of a Benoni-esque position, but it's not like this is that hard to understand. The ideas are pretty straightforward. All right. <laughs> can I teach you what a vertical asymptote is? I mean, I can, but this is a chess speed run. Yeah, similar ideas. You know, in the King's Indian, you also see some of these, some of these concepts. Okay, so he's taken on b5, we've taken back. Sorry for that. I know some people don't like me to pre-move, but a takes b5 is what we did. And, um, okay, so when a trade like this happens, we need to understand the immediate effects of the trade. What has changed as a consequence of this trade? Now, first thing is white no longer has the pawn chain. So we need to look at this pawn and say, okay, the d5 pawn is kind of flimsy. The second thing that has happened as a result of the pawn chain, uh, of the pawn trade, is that the a file has opened. Well, what lies on the a file? Ah! There's an a2 pawn that lies on the a file. Oh, how can we exploit that a2 pawn? Well, we have a rook on a8. We just need to get this knight out of a5. But we don't want to do that just yet because he wants to take the queen and open up the c file. We don't want to allow that. We have two approaches here. We can actually trade queens, but um, what we can also do is go queen to a3 and prepare to move the knight back to b7. But, <laughs> okay, let me think. Yeah, both are both are super tempting, but let's go queen a3. I know people like me to keep the queens on the board sometimes. And now we are ready to play knight b7 and increase the pressure dial on the a2 pawn. Knight b7 is black, then to kill. Yeah, so once we put the knight on b7, we're going to have to take care of this knight somehow. The knight will be kind of passive, but um, as I always claim, and you guys know this by now, not every one of your pieces needs to be, you know, curing COVID. It's okay to have some pieces temporarily on awkward positions if you know that you're going to improve them later. Hmm. Bishop e2, that's a... Yeah, Chimpanzee Chimpanze is playing very well. So he's attacking the pawn. We need to defend it. Who can propose a way to defend the pawn? What would be a, a way that is sort of conducive also to the general direction that we are playing? And we are playing on the queen side. So it would be a nice thing if we could bring pieces into the queen side and simultaneously defend the pawn. I like to move rook f to b8. Uh, because now we are accumulating a lot of pieces on the queen side, which is a little bit unusual because most games in the speedrun, at some point, we've been attacking the king. But attacks on the other side of the board 
work in much the same way that an attack on the king works, right? You need to bring pieces in. You need to identify weaknesses that you are attacking. When you're attacking the king, then by definition, the main weakness is the king. Uh, but here you need to do the additional work of identifying specific targets that you can you can pile up on. We've already identified a target. That target is the is the a2 pawn. Okay, so he's attacking b5, and we need to be careful. Our queen, we need to make sure our queen doesn't get trapped. We have a very nice move here, which also solves the problem of this knight being a little bit passive. And it also drives more pieces into the queen side, and it starts putting that very concrete pressure on his position. Well, b4, knight b5 is kind of annoying. The move is c4, yes. c4, what this does is it targets the b3 pawn, a, and b, if he takes, what should we take with? What should we take with? Well, actually, uh, either is fine. I mean, I like taking with the knight because that simultaneously opens up, that simultaneously opens up the the um the a file right so we actually solved the problem of the a file we could have also taken with the pawn though that was that would, that would have been fine okay so let's see how how chimpanzee chooses to defend here he takes we take now not only is the a file open but also the b file is open so we are threatening the move rook to b2 you can see how much pressure white is under here and none of what we've done so far has anything to do with white's king so what this shows is um, you don't always have to orient yourself toward a king side attack. You can attack your opponent's queen side uh, and, and you can do that with equal effectiveness. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, this is starting to look very, 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 very dubious. Rook b1 would drop the knight. Okay. Now we need to be very patient. Very, very patient. I, some people might be attracted to the move bishop takes c3. But look at the bigger picture here. The bishop is our one of our main attacking pieces. We don't want to give it up yet. What we want to do <clears throat> is now bring pieces into the attack. We need to identify pieces that can be improved. And as you guys are indicating, this knight, of course, was just lounging around on d7. We can slam it onto b3, onto d3. And then we're going to start looking for ways to win material. Thank you, Muel for the prime I mean look at how all of our pieces are beautifully coordinated it's like every one of our pieces is participating now in the queen side attack which tells my intuition that we're very soon going to have to start looking for ways to 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 transform that advantage into something more concrete so which means looking for tactics okay and I already see a couple of possibilities like what specifically do I notice here? Well, the knight on c3 is very is very flimsy. So there might be tactics in relation to taking... Well, if we take the knight on c3, that would be a bad move. Rook b1 is a great move by chimpanzee. Because bishop takes c3 would allow rook takes b8. Check. And then white would recapture on c3. So let's be very careful about those kinds of moves. And um, we can just ignore this. Okay, that's another thing I've been harping on quite a for quite a long time now when your opponent offers a trade uh people generally think well i have to do something about it but you really don't in many cases we can let him be the one to take our rook then we get control of the b file so that's perfectly good okay so already white is under insurmountable amount of pressure chimpanzee defending extremely well though and not making it easy for me at all and um Depending on where he goes, well, I already have several pretty cool ideas here. Okay. Yeah, I just had some some good food. I'm... Okay, so I'm, I'm looking now. I'm actually thinking about how we can go about continuing the pressure. See, Ambergy, thank you for the five gifted. Wow. Appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. Okay, my coffee machine just blipped, but I wasn't making any coffees. <laughs> Thanks again. I'm going to have to check that out. Knight e2 is a good move. Knight e2 is a very good move because he's getting the knight out of the danger zone and he's attacking He's attacking the c4 pawn. So let's defend that pawn. Now we already need to figure out how we're actually going to win this game. And the... Let me think. Hmm. So... 
The way that I want to defend it, we want to defend the pawn in a way that continues the pressure on his position. It's a hard thing for me to formulate. But a very good move. So knight b2 would not be good. And let me explain that after the game. I actually think knight b2, we're going to go queen to a4. I didn't like knight b2, and I will explain the logic behind that after the game. So, we'll see. Yeah, queen a4 also puts the rook under some pressure. So that's, that's the reason I like queen a4. We are now threatening, of course, to check on b1, and then f2 is going to fall. I mean, that position is going to be terrible. Terrible for white. So we'll see how he tries to defend this. But this is essentially over. Queen c5 was fine. No, queen c5 was good. He could have targeted this one too. Okay, now... Hmm, knight, knight c1 is also really good. Um, Let me think. Hmm. Okay, let's go rook b1. Let's pin... Yeah, there's a really, really cool line here. There's a very, very pretty line that that was what I was calculating. The reason I didn't play this immediately. Yeah, rook b1 pins the knight. White has a really interesting resource. Okay, king h2 is, is a fantastic move. So now we can essentially transform the advantage. So it would, be, it would be very nice if we could go c3. c3 uh, would be a great move. But unfortunately, that would blunder the knight. So can we make a preliminary move and then play c3? I mean, can we can we do something with this knight? And this is the concept of transforming the advantage. From a logical perspective, this move might seem weird because the knight was really beautiful. But we are, you know, we're, we're breaking the eggs to make the omelet. We are take, we're giving away the knight so that we can play c3 and the queen is overextended. Qu queen is making contact with f4. It's also making contact with the rook. White's queen cannot move anywhere to keep both of these things under control. In fact, we are winning not only a pawn, we are winning actually more than a pawn. Okay. So let's see what he does. Yes. So now, a lot of people would immediately grab this pawn. But when you have a capture like this, you always need to find the best execution for something. You just don't want to rush in a situation like this. Because the game-winning tactic can present itself in any position. Yeah, rook takes c1. You guys already see. If you, if you like just don't rush, you already have a much better chance of seeing that you can take on c1, setting up a fork and you're going to be a piece up in the end, and this pawn is going to be on the path to promotion. But nonetheless, a very, very good game by Curious, who, who put up a, a terrific fight. Good game. Now, okay, so it was a King's Indian. Right, so as I explained, the King's Indian, there are two main... Oh, oh, it was announced. Yes, Tata Steel. So you already know, Hamad. So on a, on, a, on a separate note, I will be, and I, I didn't want to announce this before because it wasn't official, but seems like it's official. Flying Puppy Dog 1, thank you for the five gifted subs. Short but sweet is this stream. Thank you. But I will be doing, I have the great honor of doing the first half of the Tata Steel over the board classical tournament, which will be beginning in a... I believe exactly one week from now, <clears throat> I will be doing the first half of the official commentary with co-commentator Fiona, Fiona Stale and Tony. And the second half will be done by my partner in crime, Robert Hess. So Robert and Sopico will be covering the second half. It's, it's probably the biggest tournament I've, I'm not going to wake and see. I will be doing it from home. Um, no, I will not be in person. I will be commentating from, from Charlotte, but the tournament itself will be played over the board, and my co-commentator will be in Wake on Zay. Um, no, the tournament is not virtual, <clears throat> but I will be commentating from home. And um, basically, it's, you know, I've never had an opportunity to commentate a tournament that is this prestigious and this, uh, of this stature. I'm super excited at this opportunity. I'm going to try to do the very best that I can. The rounds begin at 8 a.m. Eastern. So I will be alerting my 18 friends who have my number to call me at respective <laughs> times. But yeah, it's going to be an amazing tournament. I'm going to have to remake my schedule so that I, I'm fully alert and, and energetic. It's a big opportunity. It's a huge honor. But anyways, just wanted to put that out there. So that'll be happening a week from now. I'll be putting out more updates closer to the actual date of the first round. 
back to the game. Um, there's e5 and there is c5. Thank you, CS window. The problem with e5 is that right now it blunders a pawn. And it's actually not that easy to prepare e5. You can. You can go knight bd7 and then you can go rook e8. But the other problem is that if you go rook e8 and then you go e5, it looks like the coast is clear, but this actually also blunders a pawn. Why? Who can tell me why this also does not properly execute e5? What does white have here? What does white have here? Yeah, so he takes, and then we notice that the D file is open. And then we take again, and the rook is overloaded. That's a classic uh, trope in the King's Indian, the rook being overloaded like this. We take the queen, force the rook out, and now bishop takes E5, wins a pawn. So long story short, it's possible, whoops, sorry. Long story short, it is possible to prepare E5, but not easy. C5 is much easier. Okay, so c5, uh, bishop e2, we develop our knight. And a lot of people were looking at this and saying, wait a second, what happens if white plays d5? And this is one of the main ideas in some lines of the king's Indian, where the knight actually goes to a5. We saw something like this in the game. I put my knight here to attack the pawn. Here, the knight doesn't actually threaten to capture the pawn, so it might seem absolutely senseless. But in combination with a particular plan, the knight is often put on a5, in order to pressure c4. And that plan is, of course, a6 and b5. You are trying to get this pawn break to work in order to ruin white's pawn chain and get a lot of queenside play. Nobody said it's easy to prepare b5, and often the pawn is sacrificed. You will see in many King's Indian lines uh, a sort of Benko-like flavor to the position where you literally just go b5. And you do that in order to open the b-file and uh, if any of you have played the Benko Gambit, all of this should be very familiar. This is like a good Benko Gambit because you already have a lot of pieces that are aimed at the queen side. Uh, have I had any games where I do something very similar and I sacrifice a pawn on b5? I've had plenty. I've had several games where I really enjoy, as you guys can imagine, this particular line where you sacrifice a pawn and you get a lot of play. Uh, even from a practical perspective, it can be much easier to play this with with black than with white, because black has this super natural attack going on. Um, let me see. So let me show you one of these games from a couple years back. Okay, perfect. So we already have everything set up here. So this game um, from the World Youth Under 13, I was playing black. It was a different line of the King's Indian. This one was the same-ish. But here you can see that I played c5, and here I put my knight on e5 because I could. But here's b5. Here's the pawn sacrifice, and the play, look at me. Look at how simple the play is. Just bishop a6, queen a, yeah, Volga gambit, as they say in Russian. Rook f1. I take. I get my knight to c4. I mean, every piece literally just comes in, and and I just crushed him. I mean, I won the pawn back. And actually, you can see the similarity between this game and my game against Chimpanzee. Like, the C-pawn is what ultimately decided the game. The C-pawn is what ultimately decided the game. Uh, so this is a super common idea. If you play the King's Indian, you should always keep in mind this particular idea. Um, and back to the game. So, Bishop G4, we soften up uh, the D4-pawn, and now we play Queen B6. This is probably not... Amazing for black, but it's it's a pretty thematic idea. So I decided to play it now We kind of compel white to do something with the deep on and again we go knight a5 We get the knight out to open up the bishop. We go queen b4 to pressure the knight And and then we prepare b5. So we did all of this in the game after queen b6. What if he plays knight a4? Um, knight a4 we can that's a probably not a bad move But maybe we can reposition the queen on a5 and now the knight becomes awkward so yes, it's true we're no longer attacking the pawn, but now the knight is awkward. Um, no, age, age 18. I, this was under 18. Uh, so something like this. Um, after queen b4, I already think black gets pretty big pressure, so I'm not sure exactly where your decisive mistake was. My guess is... Let me think for a second. Okay, I think somewhere here, white should have played in a way to make a6 b5 more difficult so here's one 
thing I could propose. Like, you can go queen c2, and then rook c1. The fact that you put your queen on d2 made it a little bit harder for you to move the knight. Maybe drop the bishop back to e2. Maybe drop the bishop back to e2. Discourage black from playing b5. So, something like that. Um, would, have been, would have been an interesting try, because once I go b5, the pressure on white's position becomes extremely strong. Queen a3, rook b8, and everything here is supernatural, c4. A lot of people wanted b4, but this also weakens some of these light squares, and knight b5 almost traps the queen. Black has only the b2 square, and now white can excommunicate the queen from there. That's definitely not what black wants. So be very careful about these tempting moves that threaten an opponent's piece. C4 instead is much better. Yeah, so it takes knight c5. We get the knight into d3. You can see some of the similarities between this game and the game I played. Now queen a4, last thing. Uh, yeah, so, so when I'm back later tonight, I will try to do the Parham, Parham games. Yeah, there's ghosts. If I'm back later tonight. Now, um... Why did I play queen e4? A lot of people wanted knight b2. Thank you, Jonathan, for the 500 bits. Really appreciate it. Okay. Knight b2. Why, what attracts people to this move? Could somebody explain to me, somebody who proposed knight b2, what is it that you like about this move? And hopefully that'll help me a chance to, give me a chance to better explain what I don't like about it. Yeah, but you still can't push the pawn. That's the thing. Uh, because the knight is controlling that square. The, what I think attracts people is that it attacks the pawn. Right, I get it. So, so here's the thing. Um, you want to be very careful about putting a knight on b2 because that's the only thing the knight is doing. The knight is now not doing anything other than defending the pawn. It's not a great idea to tie your pieces down like this. When we played queen a4, it is true that the queen is defending the pawn, but that's not the only thing the queen is doing. Queen is also pressuring the rook. It's just involved in the queen side. Knight on b2 is otherwise very awkward. And a2 is not the prize that I'm going for here. Why well, can go knight c3? And if you just abandon everything and you take on a2, that's tunnel vision at a higher level. You've won a pawn, congratulations, but you've given up your bishop, you've weakened your king, and now white gets all this counterplay, and your pieces are sort of stranded on the upper quadrant of the board where they're not doing anything. Sorry. And also, finally, the knight on d3 is just a huge beast. Um, the knight is a beast, it's it's controlling f2, it's pressuring f2. So you want to be careful about moves like these, if that makes sense. So queen a4, um, rook b1, and now of course knight takes f4 is the decisive move. We cannot play c3 because that gives up the knight. So we do ultimately give up the knight, uh, but we do that in, in the service of a greater good, so to speak. c3 and rook takes c1. Could you say something about why you waited with rook b1 on move 25? Um, if we gave a check immediately and then took on f2, then he had rook takes c4 and he gets the c file. There's one line I wanted to show, which is after rook b1, he had a crazy resource, queen takes d3. Okay, what's the point of this and why does it not work? For extra credit, why does it not work? This comes very close to winning the game for white. Uh, why does it come close to winning the game? And what is Black's reputation? This I had to see when I played uh, Rook b1. Rook c8 check. That's not mate. But what is mate is Bishop h6. Very common tactical idea. This creates the seemingly unstoppable threat of Rook takes f8 checkmate. Uh, but there is a defense. And Rook takes c1 check. Distracts the Rook from c8. And then we can take the Bishop on h6. So, without this move, black is losing, I believe. Because you can give a check on d1, and now you literally have no more good checks. So, there is no defense to rook takes f8 checkmate. Rook takes c1 is absolutely obligatory. Good game, Chimp. That was uh, very well played. Not Certainly not easy for me. And I think an instructive game in terms of playing like a ben Benko Gambit in the King's Indian. Okay. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Skomoth, for the prime. Quite edifying indeed. Glad to hear that. All right, we got time for, for one more game. Um, or maybe not even one more game. Yeah, I, I, 8.30, I have to do something. Let's play Aquila because he normally plays fast. Um, yeah, crazy tournament tomorrow. And let's play E4. 
Okay, so c5. Okay, we, we've played the c3 Sicilian almost exclusively. This time, let's go for an open Sicilian, the main line. Let's go with d4. He plays the e6 line, which is the Khan or the Powelson or the Taimanov. Okay, so knight c6. This is the introduction to the Taimanov. And um, there's nothing white. There, there's many moves that white has here. There's knight b5. But let's play it simple. Let's just develop our knight. And generally speaking, queen c7 is the move, or a6, yeah. Now again, white has a gazillion different setups in the Taimanov, or in these lines. Literally a gazillion. I mean, you can develop the bishop wherever you want. You can go here, here, here. I personally like fianchettoing the bishop. Because what you're going to see is that the, the fianchettoed bishop does not... It, it's out of the way... And it exerts a lot of pressure on the center. So I like Fienkettung my bishop in these lines. That's just a personal choice. That is certainly not objectively the best line, nor is it a bad line. It's just one of the many lines available to us. Uh, hello. <laughs> yeah, so bishop g2, Fienkettung the bishop. And often, yeah, knight e7 is very typical. Often what black does is he takes on, on d4 and replaces one knight with the other knight. Okay, so we castle. I'm not explaining the moves because I'm just developing my pieces, just like in any other opening. Just like in any other opening. Okay, queen c7. Now we need to start um, probing the position. We need to make a plan. Yes, that's right, musical Mike. Now, basically, we have several pieces that are not developed that we could deploy. The first is the bishop. The second is the rook on f1 could be repositioned to e1 in order to... Well, obviously, in order to x-ray Black's king, that's all always a good idea in the Sicilian. But um, let's let's decide what to do with this bishop. Now, bishop e3 is... Well, first of all, bishop f4 runs into knight takes d4 and e5. I actually don't like bishop e3 that much. Uh, first of all, because there is a better prospect for the bishop. Second of all, because bishop e3... Bishop is not really doing all that much on e3. It's just sort of developed. And I believe that if we find an alternate arrangement for the bishop, it's going to be doing quite a bit more. What am I talking about here? Bishop g5 is also not it, because black can just chase the bishop away with h6. Now, remember that when you're not sure about where to develop a piece, right? Let's say you're in a situation, you're not, well, bishop d2 blunders the, blunders the knight. Uh, you're not sure about where to develop the bishop. So, you know what, what? One alternative is not to develop it. Okay, bishop f4, guys, I already explained. Bishop f4 runs into a fork. Knight takes d4 and e5. People are forgetting that there is something we can do with the bishop that's not developing it on this day. Ah, eh, fianchetto it. Fien I love fianchettoing bishops. If fianchettoed one, why not the other? Now, yes, it takes two moves instead of one. Big deal. Okay, we've developed all of our other pieces. So, okay. And I'm about to show you guys why it's very sexy to fianchetto the bishop. Because we have an even sexier move here that already basically wins the game. I expected Akila to do this. And that's part of the reason why I fianchetto. Now, how do I see this? Bishop on g7, first thing I see, it is undefended. The bishop is undefended, which means if both knights were gone from these squares, then the bishops would be in a standoff. That already, that already implies that there might be some sort of a discovery that may help the knight gets off the, get off the board fast. Knight takes c6 is the tempting move, but there is an even better execution of this. Yeah, but we don't want to sacrifice one of the knights. We don't want to sacrifice both knights. We want to, if we're sacrificing, it's, it's good to sacrifice only one of the knights. Yes, knight db5. Because we also exploit the positioning of black's queen. One second. Um, okay, so knight db5, right? That is a, a very cool move, but the logic behind it should be perfectly clear, guys. We are repositioning one of our knights. We are moving it off of the diagonal. We are sacrificing it, but after a takes b5, knight takes b5, because of the attack on black's queen, black has to attend to that, which means that we are going to then take the other bishop and attack black's rook. Completely dis... I mean, the king is just demolished there and, and black is just lost. It, does it matter in which order? It actually kind of does, because if we had moved the other knight to b5, then the black could have rejected the sacrifice and gone with his queen. Here, but even that's lost. Here, if he does that, then we can take on d6. That was the, the main reason 
why I moved this knight. Okay. Now we take the bishop. By the way, um, one sec. If we take on d6 or if we try to be fancy, then the problem is king f8 comes. And uh, king f8 comes and, and, and the king defends the bishop. So we, we can't do that. We instead take on g7. But this is perfectly good enough. We attack the rook. We take the pawn and his entire position is absolutely destroyed here. We can take another pawn if we want to. But I actually wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't take this pawn. One second. Sorry, give me a moment. Okay. So I would not take on f7 because after king c7, we get into a funny situation where I have to trade queens. And I don't want to trade queens. I want to checkmate him. So let's drop the bishop back to f6. We're already two pawns up. There's no pressing need to take a third pawn, although we could. We could even trade queens. There's nothing wrong with that. But with the queens on the board, it's going to be easier to complete the attack. Now, all we need to do is bring pieces. Whoops. God. Skype call here scared me. We need to bring pieces into the game. One sec. Okay. We need to bring pieces into the game. And, and of course, the D file is the most natural avenue to Black's King. So we are going to double on that D file and then we're going to look for discoveries that involve moving the knight away. Okay. Rook, rook FD1, keeping the other rook there to attack, uh, sorry, to protect A2. And now we're already looking for ways to move the knight away. Knight B5 check comes to mind, and then maybe moving the queen away and attacking black's queen. The OG Fianchetto bishop isn't doing anything. Yeah, but uh, it often does in these positions. I was thinking also about playing E5 and opening it up. Queen D3 to triple is fine, but we don't need to triple. Like, like we already have, you know, there's a Russian expression basically killing an ant with a cannonball um and i my you know i had a friend who would always use that my coach would always use that and um the point is it's like if you're solving a quadratic equation that you could factor with the quadra with the uh quadratic formula that's a good example of um shooting ants with a cannonball like you just don't need to use such a such heavy weaponry. Doubling is good enough. Low presto, thank you. So knight b5 check. And now we can see that the rook x-rays black queen through the lens of white queen. So if we move white queen away, black queen is going to be hanging. Where should we move white queen? Where should we move white queen? Queen e3, check. And actually, we won't even necessarily need to take black queen. We might just give checkmate here. Okay. Okay, so the king on b5 is already toast. We actually don't need to take the queen. We'll be able to checkmate the king without it. The king has only one path to escaping back, and that is to a6. So the move a4 is fine. That does win. But a4 allows the king to escape back to a6. Let's play bishop f1, drawing the king further outward. There's going to be some sort of a nice mate. Okay, there's a very simple mate. Oh, there's, <laughs> there's bishop c3 check, but there is a checkmate in two moves. There's a checkmate in two moves. Uh, simple mate. Simple mate. Yeah, check. B5 is forced. And then queen takes B5 because of that bishop. That that OG Fianchetto bishop, you spoke too soon, my friend. I'd say it's doing something. It's participating in the checkmate. So the bishop does redeem itself, but ironically it redeems itself by moving back to F1. Good game. Good game, um, Aquila. And yeah, that move bishop g7 just killed you. So, yeah. So this is like a key early position. This is a key early position. And I think I've sort of... Bishop e3 is by no means is it a mistake. There's also this nasty idea, by the way, of knight e5, knight c4. And so often the bishop has to move back to c1. But Fiend Kettling is just a much better spot for the bishop. Now, you would have to be careful here noticing the x-ray between the queen and the knight. So... But black has no way to exploit that. If black moves the knight away, then, then you fear in Keto. If black takes the knight, then the queen takes the knight and simultaneously defends the other knight. 
So uh, g6 is, is bad. Now, how should black play this position? I think Aguila, you should take on d4 and go knight c6. That's actually the main idea of knight g7 in the Sicilian, is to replace one knight with the other knight. And then you don't have to fiend Keto your bishop. You can go bishop e7 and castle. Uh, 